Not endless hours of practice, instead perfect practice. Not ability to cope, total domination of all situations. Not setting goals, because goals too often prescribe performance limits. Not doing what it takes to win, instead doing what it takes to exceed. Not force of skill or muscle, rather the explosive, calamitous force of will. Now, if you believe these things, then for you, winning is neither everything nor the only thing. It's a foregone conclusion. But if along the way you sometimes stumble, then profit from that experience, but then vow, by the power of Almighty God, it'll never happen again. Now, if you don't think that's hardcore, you ain't on planet Earth, because that's where I'm coming from. Everything I say to you today, therefore, is going to relate to what I regard as being utterly the best. I'm not talking about good enough. I'm not talking about just doing good enough to get by, and I don't believe in that. I don't even like people who believe that. I'm going to tell you how I believe, what I believe you have to do to become the best at what you do in the world of sports or fitness. Now there's another word that everybody uses every day, fitness. And I'll get into that in a little while, but there's no such thing as a fit individual. It's a pipe dream. It's uh, uh, an unattainable goal. When you stop and look at all of the various components that go into making a fit individual, you begin to realize that it is not possible to be fit. You can achieve a certain amount of proficiency in each one of the various components, but you cannot achieve maximum proficiency in all of them. So what level is acceptable? At that level of thinking, when you begin to realize that you have to decide for yourselves based upon your own lifestyle and your own, goal, your own goals and your commitments, exactly what level of which component is appropriate for you, then you begin to realize that fitness is a very personal thing, and totally personal. Uh, in fact, uh, since we gave you a definition of, uh, a lay definition of strength, the ability to exert force, a lay definition of fitness that I think really applies is the ability to meet the exigencies of everyday life with ease with a little room to spare for emergency situations. That's the definition of fitness that I work on. Fitness then for an office worker is not going to be the same thing as fitness for uh, a steel worker. Fitness for a coach is not going to be the same as what fitness might be for his athlete and so forth. How do you become the best possible fit person you can be by understanding your own life first. So I hope you know where I'm coming from. From an athlete's point of view, I'm coming from being the best there ever was or ever will be at your sport. Not just good enough to win. And being the best at fitness is being in control of your life. Let me go through the types of strength. First of all, there's what we call absolute strength. Now, absolute strength is sort of an archaic concept, in my, in my opinion. It's for pencil neck geeks and for teenage kids or pre-adolescent kids to play with when they're pumping iron like that or mama or something like that. And uh, it's what the strong men of old used in order to perform their feats of strength as paltry as they were by, by today's standards. Absolute strength then is achieved au naturel with no help from anybody. No help from science, no help from uh, state-of-the-art nutritional supplements, certainly no help from drugs, no help from uh, electrostimulation or any of the other therapeutic modalities that a lot of athletes nowadays use. Strength au naturel. And there are three types of absolute strength, eccentric, concentric, and static. 
When you ask an exercise physiologist at the local university to describe strength, this is about as far as he'll get. He'll say, well, you know, strength is either concentric, eccentric, or static. Bang. End of discussion. It's about as far as my poor colleagues have gotten in their thinking on strength. One of the nicest gyms I've been to, actually, it's, it's you know, functional. Far more functional than most gyms I've been into. I mean, I like the idea of having iron, you know. I get real tired of walking into what people call a gym and seeing, you know, pro machines. And that's all I see, you know. One time, I was giving a seminar to uh, the National Strength Coaches Association, and I opened it up uh, with a statement that emptied half the room. They got so mad at me. You see, most of the guys in there were uh, equipment manufacturers. And I said, hey, did you see all that nice equipment out there? I'll tell you how you can make it nicer. Boil it all down to a nice set of dumbbells. <laughs> <laughs> they got mad at me. I'm an iron head. And I make no apologies for it. The final, well, the final two, psychoneural or psychosocial. Mama says to you when you're a kid, don't lift that weight, you'll hurt yourself. Or slow down, Johnny, you'll hurt yourself if you fall. Or little, the girls shouldn't do that kind of thing. And it goes on and on. These, these kinds of social pressures that are inadvertently placed upon a child makes a child a weak pencil neck geek for the rest of his or her life. <laughs> all too often. And it takes nothing short of hypnotherapy to remove those kinds of socially learned barriers. I said it once, I'm going to say it again. Strength is the underlying commonality in all sport, in all fitness endeavors. Now you understand why. That's all we have. When you move, when I do this, whether I have a weight in my hand or not, I have to use strength. Do I not? When I do this a million times, I have to use strength. Do I not? So the expression of human movement is an expression of strength. They are one and the same. Strength and movement are one and the same concepts. It's just up to you to figure out how to do it more efficiently, given certain set of circumstances. So when the next time somebody says the word strength to you, all of these things are going to run through your mind and you're going to immediately comprehend the meaning of the universe and why you are here on earth. <laughs> I'm here to be god-awful strong, folks. How about you? A shot putter, same thing. A power lifter, same thing. Every athlete, you ever watch Mike Tyson punch a guy's head? That's what he does. <laughs> you know? We call it check mark training. Check mark training is the ultimate form of training ever developed by me. <laughs> and you heard it here first. It's the right way to do it, folks. If you can accept everything that I've said until now in regards to the 13 types of strength, the 28 factors underlying each, the eight technologies, and what strength looks like when you put it on a piece of paper, and I think I've fairly proven to you that embodied in that curve is each one of the 13 types of strength. Embodied in that curve, or subsequent curves, is all 13 types of strength. Then you have to accept that turning a gentle curve into a check mark is the whole reason for ever walking into a weight room or onto a playing field. Or into that aerobics room, for that matter. Dr. Hatfield, I understand that theory in the squat where you have a neg negative portion. How about in the deadlift where you're actually starting, you're, you're recoiling, you're bending down and grabbing. Stop splitting ball. hairs. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, you know, when you have to pick something up, you know, you. You may think you're not doing that gentle curve, but you are. Right. You ever see you ever see me when I deadlift? All right. The first thing I do is I jump up in the air as high as I can. All right. What do I do that for? Some of the factors involved in strength 
you know, involve a stretch reflex and stuff like that. Well, I'm trying to exude a little bit of a stretch reflex and it works. It, it adds about 10 pounds out of my deadlift, okay? And then when I grab the bar, I immediately do this. I don't sit down here and get ready, get ready and take three seconds. I want to take advantage of that stretch reflex that I just exuded, all right? And add to it by another one. Boom, boom, see? That cocking of my hips down and then up, that's the gentle curve down. A little bit of a different scenario, but nonetheless, on a theoretical level, the same. You remember in the old days, um, uh, David Rigger, the great Russian weightlifter in the 198 pound class? He popularized a type of lifting. You know what the snatch is? That's where you pull the, the weight off the floor as high as you can and then get underneath it in one movement. Well, Rigger used to do it this way. He'd stand here over the bar, hovering over the bar, and then go, hi -ya! Like that. Just dove on it. It's called the dive technique. And the reason he did it was for that stretch reflex. There's still one country still using that method, isn't there? There's a few. Yeah. A few guys that are all. still doing it. Out of position too easily. So what? <laughs> the strength, you know, the biggest problem with American weightlifters, you know, how many of you know too much, very much about American weightlifters? Not much, right? There ain't any. That's why. Uh, I mean, they're about number 37 in the world. Can you believe that? American powerlifters are number one in the world. And American weightlifters are 37 if they're lucky. Why? Because they're flogging the dickens out of one technology, one of the eight technologies. Biomechanics. They think the answer lies in looking pretty. The answer lies in strength. And the only reason for the existence of the science of biomechanics is to get stronger. And they've forgotten that very important lesson. You understand? Now, I used to look like this. Now, I look like that. I still got a little bit of a problem here. I take care of that in phase number phase number four. Where right about here, I add phase number four to my training, and it's called ballistic training. Ballistic training. So like for example, in the bench press, I during phase three, with compensatory acceleration, it would look like this. Lower the weight, lower the weight, lower the weight, and yeah! Accelerate the bar off my chest, okay? Now I'm going to do it this way. During phase, phase four with ballistic training, I'm still going to do compensatory acceleration, but I'm going to add a ballistic element. Now watch this. Lower, lower, lower. Boom! Like so. <laughs> Bounce benches. Watch. Lower, 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 lower. <clears throat> the last couple of inches, you let it drop and push. Now why would I do that? To do this. Boom! That's the nature of strength. The ultimate expression of strength. There's about four, you know, several factors on this list that absolutely demand that I do ballistic training. Now I grant you, I acknowledge the danger involved inherent in this type of training. It is a very dangerous method of training. I can't. You know, I can't uh, apologize for that. That's just the way life is. Now again, I'm, I'm reminding you, I'm telling you, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm hardcore. For the pencil neck geeks out there, you don't have to do this. For those of you who want to go to the top, this is vital, it's a vital method of training. And you've got to do it carefully and the control and only a very short period of time in your training. Take a look. What I'm talking about is three to five weeks maximum of this type of training under only very controlled conditions. Step number five, you'll start out here. And it's called plyometric training. Most of you have heard that term, plyometrics. It's sort of a new buzzword of the, of the 80s fitness in crowd, plyometrics. It's the ultimate form of weight training. Plyometric training is the ultimate form. What you're doing is 
acting upon the involuntary contractile capabilities of your muscle, but it's unbelievably damaging to your muscles. Unbelievably damaging. So you can only do it for a little while. So therefore, during this period of time, you're doing, you're doing, you know, skipping, hopping, and jumping, real light stuff. Boing, 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 like a kangaroo, okay? Right here, you do weighted skipping, hopping, and jumping with a couple of dumbbells in your hands or something like that. And then right here is when you do your shock plyometrics, like jumping off the ladder or jumping off a platform 40 inches high, you know, like for example, you know, jumping off a platform that's real, you know, this, this higher, a little bit higher, and as you hit the ground, boom, you come back up off the ground as hard as you can and as quick as you can. What the whole secret behind plyometric training is to receive and repel instantly. Make a check mark. You know, you like if you're carrying, if you're, uh, if we're having a catch with a medicine ball, and you threw the ball to me, I would catch it and throw it back. I would catch it and throw it back instead of catching it and throwing it back. So in other words, what I'm doing is concentrating on this, that transition time. That is how you make a gentle curve into a check mark. Everything else that goes before is in preparation <coughs> for this shock training. It is the ultimate form of weight training because you are able to handle monstrous loads, 3,000 pounds at a clip. Everybody understand? So plyometrics then, to, to give you a brief definition, is, is playing upon the involuntary contractile capabilities of the muscle to improve the transition from down to up. Period. All right? When I was, 1983, when I was in the Soviet Union, I got my first glimpse of real high-tech overspeed training. <coughs> Let me describe it, okay? This guy was a long jumper. And ordinarily, he could long jump about 26 feet. You know, a reasonably good long jumper. But I watched that guy, time after time, long jump 32 feet. <coughs> time after time, he long jumped 32 feet. Here's how he did it. He had electrodes on his quadriceps and, and gastrocnemius and glutes. Okay? And these electrodes were on wires going up to an overhead rig down a long runway. All right? The overhead rig was a, was a uh, wire and it had a loop on it. So he took off down the runway, and of course the rig followed him, okay? And when he hit the tow board, he completed the circuit, so electricity zapped all of his muscles, and he jumped higher and farther than he could. <laughs> and they, not only did they zap his but they zapped him in the appropriate amount and sequence. Us weightlifters, us powerlifters, we're pretty quick. You know, just like old refrigerator Perry, okay? You know, remember this this little hundred meter dash thing where I showed you Carl Lewis? He, he did this out of the box, and then gradually came down. Remember that? Well, I I can beat the, even at my advanced stage. I can beat Carl Lewis out of the blocks. Bang! I come out like a cannonball. But I'm not very fast, and I got even worse speed. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the, the point that I make here is that the very factors that make me a good powerlifter make me a, a very bad 100-yard dash man, okay? There are different energy pathways. There are different, of the 28 factors, many of the different factors that go into Carl Lewis training than what go into mine. And the things that make me great in powerlifting makes it impossible for me to become great in sprint. And the same thing is true of Carl Lewis. He couldn't possibly do the things that I do. So you got to remember that depending upon your sport and the requirements of your sport and your weaknesses and strength and all these other factors, how you train has got to be predicated upon which factors are most important for which part of your uh, sports skills. The name of the game in bodybuilding is variation. Variation is the key to bodybuilding success. You've got to do heavy weights and light weights and high reps and low reps 
fast movements and slow movements, and everything in between to ensure that all of those cellular components are stressed in order for them to be forced to adapt. Following me? And how do you do that? All right. Just to give you an example, all right? Uh, dumbbells, okay? I'm going to do arms. The ultimate form of bodybuilding training, now I'm about to show you, you can only do this about once every 10 days, because you'll kill yourself otherwise. You'll overtrain like crazy. All right, the ultimate form. So after I warm up, I'll grab the hundreds, okay? And do a set of five with each arm. Boom, boom, swing them any way I can get them up. Explosive, fast movements. Why? White muscle fiber, myofibrillarization. Okay? Then I'll put them down, my arms are screaming. I'll grab the 50s and I'll do a set of 12. All right? Rhythmic cadence with a relaxation pause between each rep. Why? I'll get a little bit more of the, of the myofibrillars elements, a little bit, some of the white fibers, some of the red, okay? And I'll also get some mitochondrial growth. All right, but in the meantime, I'm not getting all of the maximum number of white fibers, allowing them to regenerate ATP so I can go back to them in a minute. And then I go further down the rack and I grab the 20s and I do a set of 30. Slow, continuous tension, never stopping at the top or bottom. Why? By fibro or uh, mitochondrial mass, capillarization. And then by this time, all of my white fibers are recovered. I have ATP again. I run back up and grab the 90s. Boom, 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 set of five with each arm. Lo and behold, even though I just burned myself out with the slow, continuous tension, I can still come back and do explosive ones. All right? And then down to the 40s, and then down to the 15s. Back up to the 80s, 30s, 10s, 70s, 20s, 5s. Without stopping too much? No stop. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Now, mind you, that sounds wild, but that's the way the big boys do it, and it works remarkably well. Like I said, you can't do it all the time, only once in a while. In the, in the middle periods, you know. Doing more normal all the time. No, not normal. <laughs> in the middle, you'll do a slightly less intense form of training, which is you know heavy, moderate, light. You know you'll do, you'll you'll after you warm up, you'll go. Uh, let's say again, uh, dumbbells. Okay, just to give you an example, you do this with all of your body parts. Okay, you'll do a set of five, explosive. Wait a minute, another set of five. Wait a minute, another set of five. Then you're done with the heavies. Moderate, twelve. Wait a minute, twelve. Wait a minute, twelve. Wait a minute. <coughs> you're done with the twelves. Thirty. Wait a minute. Thirty. Wait a minute. Thirty, and then you're done. Nine sets. Get out of the gym. You supplement for your objectives. Now let me say something else, okay? Your training objectives, no matter what array they happen to fall into, are the same as your nutritional objectives. They are one and the same. You see, pencil necks eat to stay alive, or for some other form of thwarted gustatory indulgence. Athletes eat for 10 reasons. Now let me list them for you. Number one, to get stronger. Now you all know what the word strength means. It's got an infinite <coughs> array of possibilities underneath it. <coughs> to lose fat. To gain muscle size. Especially if you're a bodybuilder. For better workout recovery for tissue repair following injury, for anaerobic endurance, short-term endurance, for aerobic endurance, for better mental concentration, for reduction of pain, and then a catch-all area, which we'll call general health and fitness, like your vitamins and minerals, your antioxidants, and things like that. Those are the 10 reasons why an athlete would ever put anything into his or her mouth, including food, nutritional supplements, 
Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, I just got through listening to you. The 10 reasons for training. They are one and the same. The reasons for training, there are only 10, are identical with your reasons for supplementing. Whatever. You get up at 8 and you go to bed at 11, all right? You make yourself a daily clock and it'll look like that. All right? 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Here's noon. All right? Now, if you're that serious about your training, you know very well that you can't get by with only one training session a day, so you train twice a day. Now, I'm telling you this because, like I said, I'm hardcore. You can't become a great athlete on a once in a while basis. You have to live, eat, sleep, and breathe it. You have everything you do is oriented to becoming great. And all I can do is present to you what I think the best way to do it is. A double or a triple split in my opinion, is the right way to do it. So let's say you're getting up in the morning, you know, and you're having your first meal. And right here, 45 minutes to an hour later, you train. And again, you're only training for 45 minutes to an hour. You should never train more than 45 minutes to an hour at any given time. Why? <clears throat> that is to say, if you're a strength athlete or a power athlete, if you're an endurance athlete, of course, you should a little bit. But uh, everybody know what growth hormone is? Where's growth hormone produced? Right, in the anterior pituitary. How do you make it work? How do you make it st stimulate it to pour out some of its contents of uh, growth hormone? Which, as all of you know, is what causes growth, right? Well, there's a lot of cute little techniques. One of them is to keep your workouts very short and very intense. Once you start entering into a different pathway and start mobilizing triglycerides, bang, it shuts off growth hormone response because the insulin goes up. So you keep your workout short. What about the temperature of your gym? Should you ever work out in a chilly gym or? No, you should never should. If the gym is cold, bundle up. Get yourself sweating, you know, pouring sweating, hot. If your body is hot, you get a better growth hormone response. You don't eat carbohydrates of any sort for 45 minutes after workout, then you can eat. Why is that? Because 45 minutes after workout is when your growth hormone spikes. If you eat right here and your blood sugar goes up, along with that your insulin, it shuts off growth hormone. See? The only reason you work out is to get that growth hormone spike, you know? I mean, that's ever, that's all important, all important. Because that's what's gonna that's what's gonna drive the anabolic process of protein turnover, tissue repair, protein turnover, tissue growth. Is that growth hormone? So you need it. So foster it. Then you work out again right here, okay? And again, hour hour maximum hour and a half. Please. Hour and a half workout is really pushing it if you're into maximum strength, preferably an hour. Now, what do you take before workouts? What do you take here? What do you take, you know, after workout, if anything? You know, what do you take with each one of your <coughs> meals? One, two, three, here's five meals a day. What do you take with each one of, you know, <coughs> it's up to you to figure it out. I mean, I could rattle on and on and on and give you examples, but you won't learn anything. <coughs> if I did that, I've been prattling already, you know, uh, just throwing out simple examples to give you an illustration of the tremendous complexity of this field of nutritional biochemistry. And you've got to learn some of these things. And if you don't want to take the time to learn it, for crying out loud, at least read a book and sit down one time and figure out your training program, what you want to do. Or get help. Skibu is going to figure this out. He'll do it for you. Right, Skibu? Right. <laughs> I mean, that's why you come to a gym. You know, I've had a long talk with Skew. One of the things that I think is great about this gym is not so much the surroundings, it's a nice gym. It's clean, it's well equipped, it's open, it's airy, a lot of friendly faces, you know, a lot of hype and, you know, people are, like to come here to work out. But you know the biggest thing about a gym? It's not the equipment, it's to help you get in it, all right? And it's, I understand that this is a pretty good gym for that sort of thing. <laughs>